Okay, so let's now move on to the social contributors to the growth of slavery in the colonies. So um, as far as these are concerned, now first off, let's, let's bring ourselves back to uh, the stresses that the demands for labor are placing on the colonies. Now, we already f are familiar with uh, sort of the political background of Bacon's rebellion and how he feels about the the uh, governor, William Berkeley of Virginia. But let's think about how Bacon's rebellion also could be linked uh, towards some towards uh, the status of labor in the colonies. Now, first off, Bacon uh, did not actually own land on his own. He was known as a freeholder, um, and uh, his overseer uh, actually was killed by um, by Indians prior to Bacon's rebellion. But that's not what's really important, but rather the idea that Bacon is not a particularly well-off man living in the colonies. And uh, he also, as a laborer, is not particularly reliable, right? We know this because he staged an insurrection. There was a general belief that white laborers, indentured servants included there, uh, were more likely to rebel than slaves themselves, right? Some of this is because African slaves did not speak the language, they were very unfamiliar with the terrain, uh, and um, this ultimately was one of the social reasons why masters became much more inclined to actually use African labor rather than white indentured servitude, right? Also, <clears throat> the demand for slaves is going to grow uh, very quickly due to the rapid population growth that we see in the colonies, uh, particularly from about 1620 uh, until, I mean, really continuously, but in, from England in particular, you're going to see a pretty significant wave of colonial settlement until the late 1680s or so, and, and we'll discuss why that matters uh, pretty soon. So uh, another thing that's important to realize is that the South had a very uh, hierarchical social structure, right? And this is also going to be one of the reasons why slavery is justified by the people who own slaves, right? Um, first off, planters were seen as essentially the, the gentry, the same as the lords in the system of feudalism, landed gentry in their minds. Um, they were not meant to work, right? Their job was to own plantations, uh, pay overseers, and essentially reap the vast majority of the profits uh, from their plantation, right, without actually doing the physical labor. So uh, that was one reason why slavery was very much in demand. The idea that one could buy a farm, but they can't actually work on it with their own hands, right, uh, because that would be sort of beneath them. Um, and also, of course, the prevailing um, racist notions that Europeans carry with them when they migrate into the New World um, in particular, uh, what we're going to see is that uh, they establish, and this is sort of on an informal basis, it's not, um, not at least at first, ingrained in colonial law, um, but slave codes are sort of these informal codes uh, that are initiated um, towards enslaved people to basically prevent them from moving about freely um, and doing other things that may, might lead them to get into trouble, so to speak. Um, so some examples of what slave codes might have looked like, um, well, for one thing, slaves were not allowed to marry one another, um, at least not in the church, not, uh, it was not legally binding in any way. And one of the reasons why this was, was because uh, that allowed <clears throat> slave owners to split up husband and wife without having to justify themselves, and there was no legal contract keeping them together. Um, this also meant that if a woman, even if she was, even if she saw herself as married, if she had children, uh, the master could easily split up her entire family, and uh, even her children were not seen as her own. Children were seen as the property of a slave, right? So basically, the moment that child leaves your womb, that child was seen as the property of the master rather than, you know, the flesh and blood of the mother. Um, so this, of course, is... Um, some pretty stinging social evidence uh, that we can kind of look at to see why, um, in particular, uh, white people, um, white Europeans, were very much inclined to justify slavery. Um, so uh, first off, it's important for us to realize that, um, that slavery varied um, 
considerably in terms of severity, or not severity rather, but in terms of the severity of work. Of course, all types of slavery are severe, right? Um, but what we see actually is that, um, that there is even a hierarchy that exists within slavery. Okay, so, um, so some of the best jobs to have as a slave, or rather maybe one of the safest jobs one could say, would actually be to have a skill, right? So a skilled artisan would be someone like a blacksmith, right, who actually knows how to do something that requires training uh, to do. And uh, it also kind of demonstrates to us um, that they're able to produce something, produce a manufactured product, right? Um, whereas field labor is something where you're just working with gathering raw materials. So to be a skilled artisan, um, you actually had considerable autonomy uh, because you basically, you had this skill, you were left to do your job, and you did not necessarily have a master breathing down your neck. Um, another category I would put in here would be sort of merchant slaves. So those would be the type of slaves who would live in port cities, uh, Boston, Charleston, uh, Philadelphia, those types of places. And uh, basically they're, they're going to be working actually on the shipyards mostly, um, actually working on loading them, docking them, those types of things. Those also were seen as relatively autonomous jobs where again, you may not have that much oversight. Also, slaves who worked in urban areas had a little bit more freedom of movement. They could walk from place to place without having people constantly ask them where they were going. Um, then you have domestics, right? We can just think of domestics as household slaves, right? Cookers, cleaners, those types of things. Now, this is actually really complicated um, in the sense that in some ways you could see domestics as having a slightly better life because they are free from the elements, they have more shelter, they're normally working indoors. Um, but their jobs are very burdensome emotionally, one could argue. First off, domestics tend to, tended to have the job of raising the children of their masters. So a lot of times what you would find is that uh, these slaves would actually find themselves quite attached to their master's children. Um, and it could be very devastating, uh, ultimately, to see those children eventually kind of become ingrained in their parents' understandings of slavery, right? So, you know, these, in a lot of ways, these domestics were basically mothers to these children until, uh, until uh, these children became older and, and kind of realized the, the actual nature of well, what their relationship was to their slave, if that makes sense. Um, but... Another thing that's really, um, that's very emotionally difficult for domestic slaves is that because they actually lived closer to their masters, they slept under the same roof, which uh, of course could mean that there could be many, there could be instances of abuse, and these frequently happen because there wasn't much that uh, a domestic slave could do to retaliate. So domestic slaves were some of the ones that were most frequently uh, raped by their masters, and they, uh, they often, of course, carried the child of their masters, and uh, this child was illegitimate, and uh, the master very rarely would take any responsibility or claim paternity for this child, right? And then you have field labor. So field labor, again, um, it, obviously a very difficult physical endeavor, um, but one of the advantages that many historians have argued, and again, we're thinking advantage in a very in, in an interesting lens, right? We're not saying that any slave was well off per se, but what we're saying is what would be the you know best case scenario in a very bad situation, right? So anyway, um, field laborers, of course, had a very difficult, uh, difficult job, worked incredibly long hours, sunrise to sunset, no break for lunch. Women and men were doing these jobs. There were certainly female field laborers, and uh, some of them would work well into their pregnancy. Some of them would work until the very moment they would deliver a baby and then be right back on the field the next day. Um, so this is something that was not gender exclusive, and it was something where it was one of the most risky physical physical jobs, at least. Um, much more likely to die working on the field than you were in the house. Um, but at the same time, one could argue that at least field laborers can kind of separate themselves from their masters and develop a little bit more of a cultural network. Okay. So as far as um, so as far as the slave society is concerned, all right, um, it's familiar. Well, it's difficult for us to completely uh, analyze it to any European or American Indian counterpart that we've already had. Partly because uh, there is much less choice as to how slaves uh, can live. 
right? So uh, this does say family and kinship, right? There is a at least desire for slaves to live among their family members, but remember that when one or a number of people are sold, uh, this is not necessarily possible. So we actually experience in many instances uh, slaves actually will kind of formulate their own kinship networks that are not necessarily by blood. Um, so one can sort of unofficially kind of take a child under their wing and raise them even if they're not actually their blood relative, right? So kinship has a very interesting um, and unique definition when we're talking about how it exists in slavery. Um, now, again, especially among the agricultural communities uh, where slave quarters were set up, where slaves actually lived separately from their masters, um, you saw a lot of self-sufficiency, right? Uh, again, there was not as much oversight. This actually happened much more in the larger sized plantations. Um, the bigger the plantation, the more slaves, uh, the more independence a slave would normally get. So it was actually seen oftentimes as a good thing to be in one of those very large plantations where your boss, frankly, had too many slaves to really care about what you were doing. Um, slave communities would spring up organically in um, both within a single plantation or if there were several plantations close together, there could be some type of community that would emerge kind of across plantations. But to a large extent, masters wanted to exert as much control over their slaves as they possibly could. So sometimes masters would want to kind of keep their slaves in one place to prevent them from kind of socializing with, um, with other uh, communities of slaves because there is the fear that there might be an insurrection or uh, some sort of violent rebellion. So communities is kind of a loose, uh, loose term, I guess we could say here. One thing uh, that's very important and that we will continue discussing throughout the year is that slaves, when they are um, able to live at least somewhat independently from their masters, are going to start developing their own very unique culture, right? And this is really when we start to uh, refer to the idea of what African American means, right? Because as time goes on, these slaves no longer are going to identify with their African identity. They're going to lose the language, they're going to lose the religion, and because slaves are taken from so many different countries in West Africa, they have to kind of merge together and find their own way to communicate with one another. And you might just assume, oh, well, they're all going to learn how to speak English. Well, they do, but at the same time, in order to remain independent, many slaves actually developed their own types of dialects so they could talk to one another and their masters could not understand them. Okay, so Gullah is one example of that. Gullah is like a hybridized language between, um, between English and some West African dialects, right? There's also Gichi, that's another uh, good example of a hybridized language. So basically it means that they can communicate, but they can stay independent from their masters, right? Um, organization, as far as that's concerned. We already referred to this a little bit, um, but in large plantations with many, many field slaves, uh, they tend to be led by an overseer, also called a slave driver. Overseers, um, they could be other white men, um, colon colonists. Uh, overseers were not seen as... Um, they were not as highly respected job-wise, of course, as a plantation owner, kind of like a blue-collar or maybe even working-class job, one could say. So an overseer uh, oftentimes actually was quite cruel to slaves because in some ways he was not that far, far much, far, rather, excuse me, he was not that much farther up uh, the social ladder uh, compared to a slave, so he would kind of take that out on the slaves by being incredibly rule, uh, cruel and uh, physically abusive towards slaves. But then also, interestingly, slaves themselves could be overseers. And this was something that masters sometimes wanted to do um, to a certain extent, maybe to break their slave spirit, because it would be a job of a slave to discipline other slaves um, and actually uh, sort of um, social or psychological control over slaves was actually really common. And that leads us to the last bullet here, and then we'll move on with a part three. And that is the notion of discipline, right? Um, now, we could talk for a long period of time about how slaves were punished uh, if they did something wrong or if they didn't do something wrong, if they just needed to be controlled. So there's the typical whipping, what, which we know, but then there's also massive psychological damage, right? Um, you could sell a family member, right, to make them incredibly upset, um, or you could, at the very least, uh, sort of 
emotionally stress out one of your slaves by threatening to do something to them.